so we're going to begin where we left off um, in speech testing. So with speech testing, it's very important for um, fitting hearing aids and cochlear implants. It's good to have an understanding of a person's speech understanding. And one of the tests that audiologists do is they determine the most comfortable loudness level. The most comfortable loudness level is the hearing level at which speech is most comfortably loud for the patient. Most people with normal hearing find speech comfortably loud at 40 to 55 dB above threshold. The MCL is tested with continuous discourse, starting at a hearing level slightly above the SRT. Cold running speech is used and it's gradually increased. So an audiologist would say like Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and as they're saying this, they're raising the level and the person has to say whether it was been uh, better on Monday or better on Tuesday as they raise the level or back to Tuesday, back to one day. I often compare this to when you go to the eye doctor and the eye doctor says, you know, when you're looking through those glasses and he's, he or she says, um, does it look better like this or like this, like this or like this? And I know from my experience, you know, they look kind of the same both ways. So most comfortable level is a bit subjective like that where, you know, it's this or this, it's just a little bit of a degree difference and for some people it doesn't make that much of a difference. So it's not always used, but it is important when you're fitting hearing aids. There's also the uncomfortable loudness level. Now for normal hearing people, the upper limit is usually around 100 to 110 decibels. So around 100, 110 decibels, that's a very loud sound and people with normal hearing start to feel uncomfortable at that point. Now some people with hearing loss or hearing disorders, that presbycusis, that uh, sensory neural outer hair cell damage, in addition to having issues with the outer hair cells not being able to process soft sounds, the outer hair cells are not able to compress loud sounds. So when our outer hair cells are working properly, you know, soft sounds get amplified and loud sounds kind of get like toned down a little bit so that they don't become uncomfortable. But with presbycusis, sensory neural outer hair cell damage, uh, the outer hair cells are out of whack and they don't calm down loud sounds. So people with sensory neural hearing loss might suffer from something called recruitment. And recruitment means that sounds become uncomfortably loud at an earlier level than for someone with normal hearing. And that's the reason that we test the uncomfortable loudness level because we want to be able to fit hearing aids that are comfortable for our patients. And patients that have sensory neural hearing loss might be overly sensitive to loud sounds. So we test their uncomfortable loudness level. By calculating the uncomfortable loudness level and the speech recognition threshold, we're able to determine a person's uh, dynamic range of hearing. And a dynamic range is the difference between the SRT and the UCL. So again, this is helpful for fitting hearing aids. The goal with hearing aids is that we want to be able to expand someone's UCL. We want to make soft sounds easier to hear, and we want to make loud sounds not uncomfortably loud. A person, I have more about this in the notes, but a person with normal hearing is going to have a pretty wide dynamic range of hearing. For example, my SRT is probably about 5 and my UCL is probably around 105. So I have a dynamic range of hearing of 100 decibels. However, a person with hearing loss, their SRT might be at 45 and their UCL might be at 95. So their dynamic range of hearing is much more narrow than mine. It would be only 50 decibels. So by calculating the UCL and the SRT, we can find someone's dynamic range of hearing, and the goal of hearing aids is to expand that dynamic range. All right, another speech test that we do is we do speech recognition testing, and this is different from speech recognition threshold. If you remember, a threshold is the lowest level that a person can hear speech and repeat it back. Now, testing is done at one level, and we want to find someone's percent correct in word recognition. 
I spoke about this in the previous PowerPoint. The most common complaint of people with sensory neural hearing loss is that they have difficulty understanding what speech is being said. Even when sounds are made louder, their outer hair cells are still damaged and they still therefore have trouble processing speech. So the number one complaint for people with this presbycusis or age-related hearing loss is, I can hear you, but I can't understand you. We do speech recognition score. We determine speech recognition scores to help us figure out the extent of a person's speech recognition difficulty. It helps us aid in the diagnosis of the site of the disorder. For example, if a person has a sensory neural hearing loss, they're going to score much more poorly on this test than a person with a conductive hearing loss. And the reason behind that is because a conductive hearing loss, if you remember, happens in the outer ear or the middle ear. It doesn't affect the cochlea. The cochlea is still healthy with, an out, with a conductive hearing loss. So to treat someone with a conductive hearing loss, you simply have to make the sounds louder and they'll do fine. Now someone with a sensory neural hearing loss that has cochlear damage, no matter how loud you make those sounds, they're still going to have cochlear damage. So a person with a sensory neural hearing loss is going to do much worse on this test than a person with a conductive hearing loss. Speech recognition scores are also useful in determining the need for and the proper selection of hearing aids. For example, let's say you were to do this test at normal conversation level at 45 or 50 decibels and the person has a pretty moderate to severe hearing loss with thresholds around 55, 60 decibels. Well, that person's gonna do pretty poor on this test. However, let's say you did the test at 80 decibels, which would be a more comfortable level for that person with the hearing loss. Their scores might improve. If their scores improve, you could show them, look at how much better you did with amplification or hearing aids. Look at what potential you have to do well with hearing aids that you were able to score better on this test when I raised it louder. So again, this also helps with the prognosis uh, for the outcome of treatment efforts. So if someone is good at louder levels, that means that hearing aids might be a, a worthwhile option to pursue. So to use this test, we don't use bisyllabic words. We use either nonsense syllables, digits, monosyllabic words or sentences. And this test can be performed both open or closed set. It's usually done about 40 decibels above someone's speech recognition threshold or at their most comfortable loudness level. And it stays at one level. So if someone's speech recognition threshold is 20 decibels, this test would be performed at 60 decibels. And then the word lists are going to be read at 60 decibels. There's going to be no threshold search with speech recognition scores. Now, responses can be open set or closed set. With open set, a patient can select from an infinite number of answers. So I could go say the word ball, and the patient could say birthday. The patient could say lamp. The patient could say desk. The patient could say anything. The choice is open. So think of um, an open response as a fill in the blank. It's harder than a closed set response or a multiple choice test. So closed set responses would be like that picture test where I say point to the ball and there's six pictures. So closed set is easier. The person either has a group of words, sentence, or pictures that they point to. It's like a multiple choice test. Open set is harder. Open set is more common when you do this test. Now the most commonly used word list is the phonetically balanced word list. 
A phonetically balanced word list, you could see it's posted, is a list that contains all the phonetic elements of connected English discourse in their normal proportion to one another. And it's a list of 50 words that the audiologist will read, and each word counts as two points. Now, there's also a phonetically balanced kindergarten word list developed for children with smaller vocabularies. Remember, I'm not testing vocabulary. I just want to know if they can receptively hear this sound. And these tests are mostly done open set. So you'll read through the list of the open set words and you'll mark the words that are wrong. There are other tests that are often also used, but they're not as popular as the PBK or the phonetically balanced word list. Now, again, audiology is all about being like efficient with time. So half word lists are used. Um, usually an audiologist doesn't go through the full 50 words. They'll go through 25 words and each word will be worth four points. Okay, so like I was saying, half word lists are just as good as full word lists. And in the interest of time, 25 words is a lot faster than 50 words. Here are some other tests that might be used. The picture identification task, remember this is um, a picture identification task is used with adults who cannot produce verbal responses or who have difficulty selecting them from a printed word street. On it, this would be a closed set test because the option is um, limited. Now the WIPI, the Word Intelligibility by Picture ID test, was developed for small children who are either unable or unwilling to participate in the test. And this is a picture identification test where there are six pictures and the child has to identify the word that they believe they were heard from the pictures in the page. And all the words should be within the child's vocabulary. There's the NU chips, which is similar to the WIPI, but not as widely used. Okay, there's also synthetic sentences. So some people say that testing isolated words isn't real world enough because people don't speak in isolated words. So there are sentence tests that may be used. Um, each sentence has a noun, a predicate, an object, but it has no meaning. The sentences are recorded on tape and the patient responds by indicating the number of the sentence that they heard. This is less common. This would be uh, more detailed if we were going to be performing oral rehabilitation. Now, some people also say that testing in a quiet booth isn't very real world because we live in a very noisy place. So we live in a noisy place, a person should be tested on speech in a noisy environment, which would be more real world. So there are some tests where people will put in background noise to make it more challenging, more difficult. And with this, you should be concerned with the signal to noise ratio. So basically, the level of the signal to the level of the noise. The closer the noise level is to the signal, the more challenging the test is going to be used. And uh, the noise that they use, it sounds pretty, um, it's called multi-talker babble, and it sounds like you're in a cafeteria with cafeteria noise. So there'll be cafeteria noise in your ear as you're trying to identify different speech words. So again, here are some more speech and noise tests. Okay, so on the audiogram, there's going to be a place for the speech detection threshold, the speech recognition threshold, and the speech recognition scores. And there'll be an area for the right ear and an area for a le the left ear. And you need to identify um, the scores, the tests that were performed, and the level that the tests were done at. Again, like I said, there is this issue of cross-hearing. It's standard to just put 20 decibels in the non-test ear below the level of what you're putting in the regular, in the test ear. So for example, if you're doing the speech recognition score at 50 dB in the right ear, 
you would put 30 dB in the left ear. And then you don't have to worry about the left ear helping the right ear. That pretty much eliminates that concern. Okay, so with these tests, it's important to explain what is expected, what the test will consist of, and how the person is to respond. Pre-recorded materials are recommended over live voice. However, they're slower. If you are going to use live voice, you want to speak clearly and directly into the microphone, and you want to monitor the uh, intonation of your voice. You want to stay rather monotone. You usually start with the say the word, because the say the word gives the person, like, uh, they have to be alert. So every time they hear say the word, they know they have to listen for what's coming next. And you don't want to rush through the test. With recorded material, remember it's important to make sure everything is calibrated. Calibrated is saying that the signal is doing what it's supposed to do. Your responses could be repeating the words, writing the words down, or close at circling, marking, or pointing to the words. Okay, so the presentation level, about 40 decibels above the threshold for the speech recognition score or the MCL, plus 5 or 10 decibels, you could do your best judgment. There's a little bit of uh, variability depending on what you think is best. You could also test at normal conversation level, which is 45 to 50 dB. And remember, I said that's used for counseling purposes to demonstrate that difficulties are experienced. So let's say a person has a moderate hearing loss, a sensory neural hearing loss, and they're in denial, they have a problem. Well, you could do this test at 45 or 50 decibels, and the person's going to miss a large percentage of the words, and they're going to get frustrated, and it might be a little bit of awareness when you go into the booth and you explain the test to them, and you say, look, you know, I did this test at a, what is considered normal conversation level, and you weren't able to speech read me, remember, because we have our faces covered, and um, you're really struggling with speech, so maybe you should consider hearing aids, or oral rehab. And that's it for our speech testing. So it's important. We need to know how well people understand speech so that we could best serve them with hearing aids or cochlear implants or oral rehab.